Check it, check it, check it. This is a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, official, amazing Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not, not my dad. What's going? Hey, man, just having a good time, man. Just uh, you know, just uh, doing some things, man. Keeping it going, you know. Uh, shout out to all the people to be following and uh, subscribing and liking the Boss Talk 101, man. I'll let your boy. It's a unique hustle, man. So we got two special guests in here today, man. We got Jackie Lee Wheeler and we got David Thomas in this building, man. What's going on? Ain't nothing, brother. How are you all? Man, mm-hmm. we're doing great, man. Uh, hey, so these guys here, man, you know, sometimes, you know, God just uh, drops something down on you just so you can just show people how God can take people from one place to the next, man, and, and really, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, show you a testimony within the individual that you you're seeing, you know. So, I mean, these guys right here, man. Uh, history is in Dallas, Texas. Right, right. So, so what part of Dallas are you from? Uh, you South Dallas and West Dallas. You from South Dallas and West Dallas? Yeah, I grew up in both places. South Dallas and West Dallas. Yes. But your mama lived in one and your daddy lived in the other well, one? Well, granny lived, mama lived in the projects and then we moved to South Dallas shortly after. So, well, you, you know, in Fish Trap or, or Rupert Circle? Apple what? Grove, Rupert and Dale High. Rup- uh, yeah, Rupert and Dale High. Mm-hmm. So, so, so you, you, you uh, come up as a young man, so, uh, uh, Miss Jackie Lee Wheeler, man, doing your thing, huh? Yeah, doing my thing. End up getting in different other things, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's let's be real with the people. So, so you guys, uh, uh, I know both of y'all have, have been through a lot. So, right. when I met this guy right here, David, man, David and me, we we chopped it up. David said he been through a heck of a lot, you know. Sure. So, what what just just give me a just how was it coming up in Dallas, uh, growing up in Dallas, Texas, well, early on? Early, well, you know, at the age of nine. Got put out the house. I didn't understand that. But at nine? Nine years old. What did you do? I didn't understand that myself. You understand know me? But I went to the streets. Hold on. Were you living with your mom and dad at the time? Or just? My mama at the time. So she to... put you out? Yes. Were you the only child? No, about 12 of us. You Were you the oldest? Uh, no, the oldest. The oldest one had passed away. And that made me the oldest. Child. Okay, okay. So at nine years old, she put you out, yeah. and you still don't remember what it was. No, but I know that it wounded me. I know that much. Mm. Caused me to do other things that I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. Did she ever try to get you to come back home even after that? Because sometimes women tend to do things out of impulse and anger. Yes, but it's how she done it. I told my uncle I ran out when she knew I didn't. Mm. He beat me. Oh, he did? Wow, so he beat you. And and so growing up as a young kid like that, and being put out, what did you do? What did you result to? Well, uh, different things, drugs that uh, I guess medicating what was going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this was a but this would have had to be the what? What was these the seventies or the sixties? It was the seventies. I didn't know what weed was, so I had the heavy drug, heroin. Okay. Cocaine. How old was you when you got in the heroin? Uh, 15. 15. 15. I said, let me see. I had to be about, yeah, 15. You were taking it or you were selling it? No, you were shooting it. Shooting oh, okay. heroin at 15 years old. And, and, and so you were shooting it because that was your way out. That was your way to get away from what the situation happening. mentally. Yes. And the streets introduced it to you. So I went to the street, so that's what I learned, the street. So you lived, um, when she put you out at nine, you lived on the streets or you lived with friends or who did you move in with? Well, I, I live in the empty buildings. Yeah. Uh, sometimes friends and folks let me uh, over their house. Yeah. Okay. Get in some tissue. Mm-hmm. To take a break for a second. Just get him, get him some. It's all right, brother. Cause that, you know, the, the, when you go back to those places where where you where, where all these incidents happen, it's a cleansing point, really, to be honest with you. So you have to you have to go down those roads just to 
you know, just to um, really, really, really do some, you know, some soul searching, right? But 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 at 15 years old, that had to be pretty tough, you know, to to have to try to fend for yourself early on like that. So, as you was, um, as, as, and we're going to get back into it. Um, so, dealing with, 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 with being kicked out, but being on drugs. Because heroin, I, I, I only seen this in the Ray Charles movie. Uh, 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 it, it has a tendency to, you still can, can uh, you know, go day-to-day -day activity. You still oh, can yeah. do day-to-day -day activity. I was, uh, you know, I worked, you know, as a... Uh, in my habit at, fif at 15 at 15 washing dishes downtown uh greyhound bus station first job i had so yeah yeah mm -hmm. and, you know led to other things you know? and yeah. nobody knew you were on drugs is, th is that a drug that you can just really hide you well not, not really. really you can see the the you can see the injected places yeah. mm -hmm. sometimes it, it Some depends on how much the user is using because just like when you said Ray Charles, after a while with him, they, they call it, what, a junkie itch? Junkie itch yeah. and all that. Is that a, is that a real thing? Is that thing? a real thing? Yes, it, it is. But, uh, you know, you can fool yourself like you ain't no junkie when you really are. But you uh, was, uh, like I say, I put in my heaven. I worked and I, you know, took care of my business, you know, things I was doing, you know. You know, Did you have children at an early age? Yes, I had a son. He was, we had him at the age what? How old were you when you had 16, him? 16. 16, because he, he had been kicked out ever since he was yeah. nine. Right. And so at 16, you have a son. And, and so when do you, when, when do, what causes you to get into crime? I, out in the street, riding around with older guys, and I was the youngest one in the crowd. You know? And what, what happened? Uh, you know, breaking in buildings and doing a little everything, you know, climbing fences and warehouses and things like that, train tracks, whatever, you know. To make money. Everything. Did you ever, end, you ended up going to prison? Yeah, I ended up going to prison at the age of 19. 19. About, you know, second, second time went back, you know, had three. Then they gave me an aggravated life sentence for the third time. Wow, they give you an aggravated life sentence. Right. What was that for? Well, they uh, took theft cases. They did what? Took taking a theft case and made them out of aggravated wow. robbery. Wow! Do you think this was something that was over over the top? Yes. I th yeah, it was. You we, see what I'm saying? To take what a, county was it? Where Dallas? Texas. Dallas. Mm -hmm. did, was it a judge or something that had a a, a, a thing to where they was trying to make well, example, make an example out of you? Well, not so because the judge that used speaking to the mic. The judge that used to be in that courtroom, he went and went for it. So they waited and put a visit judge in there. Oh. Okay. And mm. that's how it ended up you getting yeah, aggravated. Like I said, when they knew it was a theft case. Wow. Did you try to appeal it? Uh, meat and cigarette at that. Really? Mm. The Safeway stores back then. You meat and cigarettes? Yes. Made an aggravated robbery then. You know, and I didn't understand that. And you had a pistol? Did you? I should have. Yeah, I because if it's a, aggravated. It me out like that. And I, I never robbed anybody, but I ended up with a robbery case. Wow, they just slid it in yeah, there. You know, just crossed me out. So the court system was corrupt. It, it really was, you understand me? Still is. I, I, I wouldn't say that I was guilty for no aggravated robbery. If anything, theft like it was. Wow. Nothing, no evidence, just for somebody to say he's the one. Mm -hmm. And that was the butcher, you know, they had no meat, no cigarette, no knife, no nothing. How old was you at this time, about 20-something? Uh, I was, uh, how long I was? I was. Because you was 19 at first. At the first, first one, right. I got a license at the age of 27. 27. Okay. And so, when and that was his third time. Yeah. So, how, how, and I was asking because I wanted to know how much aggravated life carried at that time, what you had to do before you could come up for parole. Well, you aggravated life. So I've done twenty-one calendar years. Wow. So I you did twenty-one on, years. Come on. That, at that time. Yeah, I done. I'll come on at the age of forty-two. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm sixty-seven now. Missed a, a lot of your life. And still having to deal with parole. Yeah, for the rest of my life. Mm. 
Wow. How was it trying to reconnect with your son after all that time? Well, they had grown up. Yeah. Things, you know. Uh, but were you able to build a relationship with him? Yes, he is. I have four boys, and, you know, uh, two of them still come around, you know. Wow. Man, I sure appreciate you for coming on Boss Talk 101, mm -hmm. sharing your story, man. You know, it's it's sad because it was a lot of times you look at uh, Craig Watkins and those guys that went and got those guys out of prison because they was they they was they was mis you know misusing them or, mm -hmm. or, or or you know they falsely accusing them or are they doing things to trump up charges and you know the guy that got mm -hmm. out that uh, Kelly was with mm -hmm. you know they went and found out that these cases wasn't right you know mm -hmm. what I mean yeah. and they would they they start uh, re, you know put, really pretty much giving them their life back. Man. Because right. these people were still stuck in. That's in, where Innocence Project was created. Correct. No. So this is this this stuff is uh, real, man. It's real. It's real. And 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 you you lost a lifetime behind behind trumped up charges. Yes, but yeah. uh, it, it, but be honest with you, uh, it kind of helped me. Okay. What I mean by that is where I was heading. You know, many times people don't believe, and you know, when you have a calling on your life, I come from uh, Baptist preachers and things. Okay. But I was doing what I wanted to do. Okay. And uh, I realized, you know, after I got down back back in prison, I said, uh, I'm supposed to come out this hole. Yeah. I had the drugs, I got out of my system, and made me a, uh, Look at the things in another way. I've been home 21 years now. Hey. And I never stayed home that long. Wow. And it don't woke me up. I ain't shooting no more heroin. Yeah, yeah. Was there something that happened in prison that caused you to, uh, want, to, caused you to want to change? Yes. Number one, uh, I realized that uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't a way for me. Because I brought up right. So it's really you getting older because this was your third time in prison. And yes, I had got older and I had uh, begin to look at things in another way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I said, well, you left your kids in right there. So, you know, I was, I was trying to blame it on my man for a while. No telling what she had to go to through uh, having 12 kids. Yeah, it's correct. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do. So I had to look at it another way. Did you know your father? Uh, not until uh, I was 22. You know, they're coming out the second time out of prison. But you know. Uh, was he in prison? No, he had never been in prison. Or thing. Yeah, he was from Midland, Texas. So I guess he went yeah. back to Texas. Where's Texas? Did you ever, were you ever able to build a relationship with him? Yeah, you know, I had no animosity. I spoke and things like a, you know, proper song would do, but I was doing my thing, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. How you doing, you know what I'm saying, this and that other. Not no real relationship, you know what I mean? Such as with my boys, you know, seemed like the same way, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and yeah. that's the reason why I ask mm -hmm. that question is because a lot of times mm -hmm. people end up in this situation because they didn't have that father figure to really be stern and put them in a certain way, you right. know, lead them in that right way. Because a uh, mother can give you that love, but she can't be that stern father figure for you, for a man, right? to be able to lead them in the way in which they should go. And one of my songs came over there, Why Would I Cry Like a Baby? He was five. No, he was Right, what, five years old when I left. So he came over to Wild Woods. I said, boy, I love you being a penitentiary. Three years, sent him from another unit. Okay. Wow. They put you on the same tank? No, one thing, but they let me be old because I was up front with the wardens and things. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? From the field to the front. But, uh, huh. You know, get to think about many things, you know, uh, many things, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, uh, I'm just glad to be home. I come home to rest now, you know? Yeah, yeah. All the things I had to do down there, even for the work and thing. The job that I had in prison, you know what I'm saying? The field job, mopping the hallway, working in the gym, made state approved trust and working up front now, so, you know. 21 years. 
How hard was it to, because I know what you said when you were in prison, you made up your mind that when you came out, that was it. You were not going to, you know, go back. Yeah. How hard was it to actually do that when you came out? Because a lot of times some people will say, in prison, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But when they come out, they end up right back in the same situation that they were in, whether it be because your friends that you had before you went in helped pull you back into that same situation again. So how hard was it when you came back out to stay well, good? I had a, a made up mind. Really, I did. And I had started practicing uh, back to gospel that I was in. So that kind of helped me. So I got into me a good church home, Pilgrim Rest. Okay. And been over there 20, 22 years now. And uh, I have a, it, it, the word will set you free. I'm not getting hey, trying to speak. Uh, no, 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 you know no, no. I it, listen. It helps me. Because mm -hmm. if it didn't help me, I wouldn't be sitting right here now today. Amen. And then I began to listen to the word. If you listen to the word, the word will change you if you want to be changed. Yeah, yeah. But then after I got into the gospel, I found out that I serve a good God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He don't give me what I deserve because I deserve death. Yeah. But he give me life. And I appreciate that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not getting on this Jesus thing, but I'm telling you how <laughs> I feel. Mm -hmm. And he'll help you to forgive. Yeah, that, yeah. He can forgive my mother. I, I was just about to the, ask you know, about all that, that too. Type of stuff. This stuff is real. Were you ever to, well, able to gain a relationship back with your yeah, mother? Yes, so a little before she passed away. Because uh, the, the, the words that I had in my heart were nice. Yeah. It really wasn't, brother. I asked the Lord to change my heart from thinking that way about my mother. And he did. Amen. You see, a lot of times people don't realize that the reason why people are how they are sometimes is things that they go through. Because being a child... Kids don't ever understand what adults go through. And until you're grown yourself and have to go through certain situations, then you realize that, you know what, it's how they were taught. That's they right. may not have known any better. That's right. So then you learn how to forgive because kids don't ever understand it. We children just think about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's unfair. Why are they acting that way to me? Why me? Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? But I know that everything happens for a reason because God put us through these things for mm -hmm. other people to see and realize that there's another way. And he also puts other people in our lives. That's right. Correct. Now, let me ask you this. So you had 10 brothers and sisters that were still living. living. Uh, how many boys and how many girls? Uh, well, nine boys and four girls. Wow. Nine boys and four girls. No. Mama moved to Houston in uh, 72. Took the last four kids with her. Okay. My, my other sister went with their daddy. My older sister got married. My other brother had went to penitentiary, so I went to the street. Mm. Wow. That's something else. That's a that's a huge family. Mm-hmm. And being single or not with, you know, How many and doing still all of that. Mm. The first uh, both of them passed away. So it's, it was 12, so uh, all of them except the first four. So that, 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 mm -hmm. that prison preserved you? Yes, it did. And I, you know, I, uh, hmm. That's uh, something good that came out of yeah, it. Yeah, it did. But I'm still learning, you know, I really am. I find out that ain't what you do, it's how you do it. Then they say, surround yourself with good people. Mm -hmm. You understand? Know you're going to get with cor cor corrupted people, that's what you're going to get back of rugby things, you know, and I, I'm a loner, mm -hmm. you know, that's how I met this young man across the street from me, and, you know, good brother, good brother. Let me, let me, let's get in old David, David Thomas, man, how you doing, yeah. man? All right. So, so David, let's go down that rocky road that you, uh, you, you came up, uh, in, in, in Dallas, uh, what, how old was you when you first, uh, encountered, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, first of all, what part of Dallas are you from? All over. All over. Not the Grove? Everywhere. Everywhere. Literally. My mom, I tell you that uh, growing up, I had everything from living under a bridge pretty much to having a silver spoon in my mouth at different times. And uh, it was because she was young. She was 16 when she had me. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, my mom went through some shit, too. 
And uh, it took me going to prison and us just really sitting down through the visits and talking to find out that we had so much in common. Yeah. But let's, let, I don't want to jump the gun. When you first, because uh, you, you ended up going to prison as well. How long did you do? 25. You did 25 years. From 17 to 42. That's why I snickered when he said 42 when he got out. <laughs> <laughs> From 17 to 42. And, and and I didn't ask you, but uh, what, what was the first unit you hit? Beto 1. Beto 1. How long did you stay on Beto 1? Oh, I stayed over there. First time was uh, probably about, I don't know, six months. Six months. Uh, yeah, and then I went to LS2. LS2. And then from LS2 to Ferguson, from Ferguson back How long was you at Beto. Ferguson? Oh, I was on Ferguson... From, I think, October 91 till LS2. Yeah, it's LS2. I was on LS2 from October 91 all the way up to uh, July 92. From 92 of July all the way up till 95 wow. on Ferguson. Uh and from there, went back to Beto in 95. And uh, from there, right before I went to SEG for a little while, I did 19 months at SEG. Wow. Uh, supposedly assault on officer when it was actually the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. Just, just, I, I need to understand, when you first, what did you go for? How did you end up into the crime life? What 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 happened? Well, I'm, I'm gonna be brutally honest, man. I I had a lot of shit going on in my life, man, and that was, uh, you know, I didn't have to deal with the drugs and stuff in my life, but, um, I started stealing things at a young age, you know, bicycles and just miscellaneous things, running around. I started running around at 11 years old. Okay. And uh, it was because I wasn't getting the attention I needed, you know. From your mom? From my mom. And my mom had already had multiple boyfriends, fiancés. And How many kids did she have? Me. Just him. Just you. Yeah. So her attention was mainly on her boyfriend. Trying to get me a daddy. This was her primary uh, thing. Okay. She wanted me to grow up having a dad. Okay. And... Uh, you know, my dad was an ex-con himself, Charles David Thomas, a uh, good pot smoking ass son of a gun. <laughs> um, but he was. Did you meet him? Yes. Uh, he was highly illiterate, and the only thing he had was his hands. He knew how to work on cars. So I kind of gained that from both sides. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of shorted it down a little bit. I'm trying to understand uh, how you got all this time for stealing. Well, and you're white. White people usually don't got to go to jail that long. Well, you didn't know is, no judges or nothing? That's <laughs> the problem. When I was 17, uh, I had already been, well, let me back up. I had issues going on because at five, my mom Lean had a Hispanic. A bit. Oh, at five years old, my mother had, uh, sorry, had a, uh, Mexican fella that was one of her fiancés, and he he raped me. I Whoa. was tied so, on a bed with jump ropes. And he raped you. And, you know, beat me. And yes, How old? I was five. He was five. Uh, so he tied you on a bed yes. at five years old. And where was, was your mom? My mom didn't know at first. And uh, when she finally listened to me and found out, what was going on, she took me to adoption agency because she felt so screwed up. And uh, I ended up going through an adoption agency and uh, there's one black family, they had a, uh, a child on the way and the the mother and the father took us out there to town East Mall. Now this is being relayed to me by my grandmother and my mother, okay? Um, I fell asleep on one of the benches and they left me 
because I started having nightmares. Wow. And I was screaming and throwing a fit. The police took me back. But they didn't. They knew what you went through, didn't they? No. Oh, I'm talking to people who adopted you. They didn't know? No. Okay. Um. So then I ended up in Cliff House. Cliff House was the, literally, the worst uh, place for children. Um, at that time, there was, just, just put it this way, there was some really raunchy stuff going on. Mm-hmm. And they put me in a seclusion room, kept me in there for 24 hours. No food, no bathroom break. There's a window that had barbed wire in it, fencing and bars. And this is a place for kids? Yes. And does this place still exist? No. I was literally the person that caused them to be closed. Because when my grandmother come to pick me up for visit, because my granny was trying to, to adopt me at the time, and she did, ended up doing it. And this is your mother's mom? Yes. Okay. So uh, what ended up happening was my granny come to get me, and they tried to, you know, they made me shower and then tried to get me to eat, and I told them, you know, dude, try to feed me, man. You kiss my ass. So anyway, I uh, told my granny, and my granny went in there and went off on them, got the police involved and stuff. Never went back. But the damage was already done. And uh, I ended up, you know, I got, uh, back then there was no such things as, you know, a beating. (laughs) You got your ass whooped. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I, I deserved a lot of it, but uh, also I deserved the attention as a child deserves, and I just didn't get it. You know, the only thing they could see was my dad. When they looked at me, they seen my dad, not, you know, me. And uh, so time goes by, and uh, I end up in salesmanship and a couple of other places, and then after I got out of there, I had uh, <clears throat> uh, fired a gun off at the house and I had been just being disruptive, you know. Uh, by the time I was 17, I'd already been through Waco Center for Youth, Promise House, and Casa House, and uh, Casa de Blanca, excuse me, which still exists. Uh, and my mom, listening to the people from uh, Submanship Boys Club camp, because she had put me in Taekwondo back when I was 12, they told her, you know, some bullshit. Oh, well, if your son ever gets mad at you, he's going to kill you. Mm. So my mom lies to me and tells me that Master Lee's, you know, screwing us over and not really teaching me anything. But I was doing better. I felt better about myself. My grades were doing good. Mm-hmm. Because martial uh, arts is supposed to teach you discipline. Yes, and it does. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to any any parent, uh, if you've got a disruptive child and you can get them into a martial arts and teach them. Now, this is the thing, though. If that child is willing to learn and they, they start showing improvement in other areas, then keep them in it. But if they're starting to show more aggression, then they need to be pulled out. But, and then that'll change their mind and then possibly bring them back in it later. But the, so I ended up doing a year and four months in Terrell State Hospital uh, from 15 to 16 years old. Wow. And uh, ended up, I lived with my dad for a little bit Mm -hmm. and my two little half brothers. uh, And, uh, you know, I went through some abuse there a little bit. It it wasn't bad. It just the uh, it was an adjustment. Let's just say that. So but when you think about Terrell State Hospital, you think about it for crazy people. Well, it is technically for mentally unstable people, but they have an adolescent unit that is there. Okay, and the misconception is not everybody that has a mental issue is. Uh, Admitted there. Loopy. Right. Okay. There's people that, all right, well, let's say uh, the soldier, the minute, you know, the soldier mm-hmm. that goes P- to war and he comes to PTSD, PTSD mm-hmm. they didn't have labels for PTSD back then, just like ADD. Right. They didn't have ADD. Oh, he's just a disruptive little piece of shit, and that's mm-hmm. how they looked at us. 
and they misdiagnosed a lot of us. But and everything I got that. today, but everything in today's society is labeled. Right. And labeling can be good and bad because yes. everybody uses it for just to anything. use it for anything. Yes. Um, even like everybody has mental health issues because meeting so many people who come on this show um, because whether they've been raised by a single mother, single father, having the absence of the father causes mental issues. That's why they acted out. They, yes, they may not have went to prison or did something that, but that's the reason why they did what they did. Yep. So, or could have both families, both mother and father, but still ended up on the street. I mean, there's so many different reasons and everybody, you know, it's mental health. But back in the days, it was like, that child needs a good whooping. Yeah. Let me ask you this. When you first uh, went through what you went through with your stepfather or whoever that guy was that abused you, did you second guess your, your, uh, your sexuality in prison or anything like that? No. Or did that ever, so you already knew that wasn't right? Yes. And that's great because I've heard yes. a lot of people say that. Now, this is something that... Uh, Okay, I was a little player, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you now, my mom has still got pictures somewhere of where, uh, there's, you know, maybe the little wading pools. I'm about four or five years old, and I'm in the wading pool, and two of my little cousins. So they go inside to grab the Polaroid. They come out. I got both of them standing up naked, and I'm sitting in the swimming pool <laughs> looking up, <laughs> grinning, you know, uh, Stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? So I've always loved my girls. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that just had to be, that yeah. just had to mentally uh, would be a block or something. Or, or either you, you either react to it in a way to where it affects you or you, you, you begin to hate the people that are like that. It or created a lot of anger inside of me. Is and that what caused you to get into the criminal activity later on, you think? No. What caused you to get into criminal activity? Circumstances. Circumstances. The... Now, see, I didn't have, uh, that's what I was trying to get at. And I don't know, I kind of beat around the bush a little mm -hmm. bit. So if I'd go, kind of pull me back in a little bit. Um, what I did, I'm, I'm going to get there. So after I left Terrell, I go back with my dad for a little bit. And I leave his and I go back to my granny and my papa. Me and my girlfriend, she's 14, I'm 16. We run off. She takes off. I go back. And uh, me and my papa got into it. So I'm almost 17 years old, and I literally get pushed out the door, you know, damn near at gunpoint, and uh, I'm out on the street. That lasts for about a week. Now, a Mexican girl named Lola, 24 years old, uh, we uh, messed around a little bit. We didn't do nothing, but we drove around and stuff. And uh, I ended up in Promise House, or no, Costa de Blanco, and then Promise House, and then Waco Center for Youth. And I turned 17 uh, in Promise House. Well, at Waco, I ran into some problems. And it's because I'm hard-headed and I had a lot of anger issues. And it's because I couldn't forgive. I couldn't forgive past. And I always felt pushed. And when I would go, you know, people would just push and push and push. And then when I stand up, oh, I'm the bad guy, you know. So it just pissed me off even more, and I just started acting out. So I get kicked out, and they drop me off downtown Dallas at the old Salvation Army on Harry Hines. And uh, my mom comes up there, and she paid $9, excuse me, uh, for nine days, not $9. And... I started getting in trouble. Uh, met two dudes, and it's funny because both of them were like 300 plus pounds, and God darn, one of them's name's David, and the other one's Thomas. Hey. <laughs> so, you know, I realized it one day when we was driving, I was trying to steal a purse. And uh, we had already stole a couple of cartons of cools because they had a little cigarette scam. I'm no big timer. I didn't do anything major, but then I met my fault partner. 24 years old and ex-con on parole psych patient Robert James Bailey. Robert James Bailey. Yeah. And uh, he told me he know this old man that's got some money just got a paycheck. 
So I come up with an idea as to how to rob him. And uh, he goes in, and then I knock on the door. He hits him in the head. Wow. And uh, we... Uh, it's all right. It's all right. I did some pretty bad shit to that poor old man. Wow. And... Uh, what did you guys do? What didn't we do? Y'all raped him? No. What did you do to him? But he's still living, right? I don't know. I I, I don't honestly know. He was 59, hun, and I, I just... Y'all beat him uh, up pretty bad. Yeah, I, I sprayed him in the eyes with Lysol Arm & Hammer spray at first, and my fall partner was punching on him, and after hitting him in the back of the head with a Coke bottle... Uh, tied him up, put him on the bed, and uh, I hit him again in the back of the head, trying to knock him out. And I told my fall partner to watch him. I went in and started pocketing stuff. Anything I touched, I put in my pockets. I left no fingerprints. And uh, I seen a fireplace poker. I picked it up and I grabbed it by the hook, and I went in and I hit him 32 times in the back of the head. Wow. This by the grace of God. 32 times. And I don't believe it was for him. It was for me that he lived. That's that anger you were letting out. He was a Shriner. Wow. And Shriners are Mason supporters. Correct. He was a Shriner. And to top it off, they are also the ones that support the Bishop Boys Club camp. So I was taking out a lot of anger that I had on some of the abuse that I received there. Did you you knew he was a Shriner when this was happening? When I, when we opened the door, you saw I, the yeah I seen the the fizz, you know what the fizz is right the hat, mm -hmm. um and his little trophies and stuff, and uh, it's just like everything came flashing back. I went completely white calm. It's it's like there was no the whole thing was everything I did was methodical. And it scares me to think, you know, because when I get into a situation, uh, it don't matter if it's I'm driving and a diesel damn near runs me over. It's like this white calm comes over me and I just, I go, you know what I'm saying? And I, somehow I make it through it. And uh, I don't know, man. It, it just, I want to channel that to a better mm -hmm. way, and that's what I've been trying to do since I've been out. Yeah, how long you been on? Uh, almost six years. Six years. So uh, when you when when you look at uh, what you guys done, I know clearly that you're remorseful for it. Um, that old man, he didn't deserve that, and I don't. I'm not to judge whether he did or didn't, but I wish to God it hadn't have been me. Yeah, I wish that I had done something like steal a damn car and get my time that I got because, honest to God, knock on wood, I'm going to tell you, I needed that time. Well, let me ask you this. When, how did you guys get caught? We drove around in the man's car for over a week. Wow. Went all the way up to Louisiana, hawking jewelry and stuff, and uh, just over the border, come back and uh, drinking. and I mean, Thinking not, you not weren't going to get caught because that's the thing I can't understand. When people do certain things and I'm like, it's his car. So police is already tracking that. Why wouldn't you think that? Because they thought he was dead. My fall partner, uh, I told him, hey, where's the keys? And uh, my fall partner sitting there with him. Well, he's still alive. I said, well, shit, cut his throat. Wow. And my fall partner had found a lock timer, old timer's lock blade. And that thing was duller than his pen is on the side. Thank God. Didn't register to me. If it had, I probably would have told him to get a butcher knife. Um, so I go out the car, try to start the car, and I'm shaking so bad because my adrenaline's pumping. I can't get the damn key in. And uh, ball partner says, man, he's still alive. I said, shit, cut his throat some more. And I think about that, and it's just, it's like, Man, I had so much anger that life didn't mean shit to me, you know, because of all the things that had happened to me in my life. 
No, no it need to be on somebody else. Same yeah. Way. Well, let no. me let, let that, me ask you this. So, don't mean to cut you off, but after you done that, this guy y'all drove around in his car. You end up getting caught. When you get caught, you go to court and all that. Does he show up? That's to exactly court? what I was thinking. Yes. So you know that he hadn't. So he showed up to court. Mm-hmm. I was. So you had to face him. Yeah, but. But you weren't remorseful at that time. No, no. I How were you feeling at that time? I was more scared. I was just, the only thing I was, it was about me. And it's all it ever was. When I was younger, after the stuff that happened to me at five, and it's, it's about me, you know, fuck the world. You know, hey, man, the world don't give a fuck about me. Why should I give a fuck? That's pretty much how I felt. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, and uh, it's sad that there's a lot of people out there like that now. You know, there's still a lot of people in prison like that that don't know how to forgive. Yeah, but the thing is, man, um, <laughs> being that you're here now, God gave you a second chance. But you have to go through. God places through certain things purposely and just like what you said you wish you hadn't done that you wish you had stole something and went to jail but if you had stolen something and went to jail you might not have changed because it might not have been something that severe sometimes people we look at some people's lives and we see them do crazy things and still don't learn and like what is it going to take what do you have to go through what god has to really put you through for you to really get it through your your skull you know what i mean so you saying that you had to go through what you had to you yep. see what i mean well 95 came along i went in in 91 95 come along and you know i was in a transit on beat one in wing and uh i had just got through telling this big old whopper i mean uh, you know because that's all i did i lied you just like lie all the time yeah i used to lie i mean i was a habitual liar and the thing is that I just wanted people to like me. You know, I had these wild ass stories about how, you know, I knew drug dealers or I knew uh, chop shop dealers and all this other crazy shit. And the thing is. In the pen, they believe you because they ain't got nowhere to go. They can't. Well, not only that, everything I told, I told it in such a way that it was believable. After telling that whopper, I turned around. I remember turning around real clearly in my cell to go take a piss. And I see my mirror, and I see the face in the mirror, and I remember having a dream when I was in juvie. And I seen that face, and the first thing I heard was the Holy Spirit talking to me. Wow. And I know it was God. He says, is this who you want to be? Is this who you want people to like you for, or do you want people to like you? And I sat there for a second, and I turned around, knock on wood. I turned around, and I told everybody, and I told them the truth. I told them who I really am, what all happened in my life. And they'd tell you what, man, I swear on my name in heaven, it got quiet. Quiet. The whole freaking wing was quiet. In prison. In prison. On transit. And these people are listening because you God was there. You told the truth. Yeah. And I made a point from that point on. I wasn't going to be lying. So... When I got out of transit and went back to the wing over there and I started telling people who I really am, if somebody said, hey, Wolf, you remember, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, I, hey, man, I'm sorry. I lied. I had one dude particularly. I can't remember his face, no race or nothing, but I do remember the incident. I remember going to him and telling him, hey, man, I lied to you. I apologize. This son of a bitch probably week, month, whatever it was down the road, is behind me and another fella probably about one or two benches back but I can hear him and somebody else come up to him and I heard him talking hey man you know Wolf yeah say like, man this somebody said such 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 well if he told you that that's cause that motherfucker either believes it or it's true because that dude told me after I told him the truth I'm not gonna have anything to do with you so, uh, it's like, man, I can't, uh, I got to take this call here just a sec. Um, I don't want to lie anymore. I'm not going to tell lies. That's for the birds. So, I made up my mind. People started listening to me when I said things. 
And that's just all there is to it. That started my life. So anyhow, you know, try to bring us down. Yeah, because we could have shut it down. But the thing I can say is, man, when I look at what your, your he, the guy shows up to court, you guys have to, you, you didn't say you didn't feel nothing, but man, his throat is cut. This guy's, mm -hmm. he's he's been abused by you guys. Hit 32 times in the head. My grandmother said that his head in the hospital was the size of a watermelon. Wow. So. So she went and saw him? Yes. Um, my family was really pretty devastated by it. And uh, about the time that I gave up the line, I had already been reading my Bible. I've done read my Bible one and a half times. And uh, now we'll fast forward real quick because when I went, got much time. 2003, God made another change in my life. And uh, I had done been through Cairo and some other stuff going on in my life. Or no, I was fixing to go to Cairo's. I had actually got my GED. I went in the chapel, and I talked to uh, Chaplain John, or deep, big, anyway, I talked to him, and uh, we sat and we prayed for a minute, man, and I forgave the man that did that things to me. And on my knees, I swear to God, when you forgive something that you've held on to for your whole damn life, man. that... I mean, it has destroyed you yeah. from the inside out and brought you so much pain and anger. Wow. It felt, it literally felt like a dump truck sized boulder coming up off my shoulders. Wow. And I really started making progress from that point on. Because people don't understand that forgiveness is not for the person, it's for you. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, vengeance is, is, vengeance is mine, says I will right. play. You know, you just, you just, you know, you guys have told some extraordinary stories here. I didn't get to ask you uh, how many units you hit. You probably was on one primarily. Well, first off, uh, Clement, call it. Clement, yeah, Clement unit. Uh, second time, Darrington. Darrington. Last time, East Ham. East Ham. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so you know, well, I was on more than just the ones I told you. I'm pretty sure they 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 change around a lot. You guys, mm -hmm. you know, I I just pray. That you guys, um, um, you know, understand that what you went through, it it was something that can help others. Now that you went through it, you mm -hmm. know how to talk to a person who's going through the things that you have encountered. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you, the forgiveness thing is so powerful. Yes, it is. Because whatsoever you bound on earth shall be bound yep. in heaven. Yep. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Yep. Behold, I give to you the keys to the kingdom of yes, heaven. Yes, sir. So you got to understand God has a way of cleaning you. And, mm -hmm. and, and no matter what you guys have been through, God still is written. Mm -hmm. He wrote it. Right. it and and the, no devil in, in hell can get the credit that God got you here for a reason. That's right. Yeah. Man, I mean, I, 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 I sit back and I often wonder, man, about different things, man. But one thing I do know, when I seen you in that car that day sitting out here in front of the store, I knew that I, I after we turned around, I, I said, man, I got to get this guy on the show, man. And then he blessed me along with you, Mr. Willow. You know, the thing you got to understand, man, is God don't make no mistakes. No, he don't. So I just thank mm -hmm. God for y'all brothers, man. And I want you guys to understand that if, 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 if you need somebody to talk to, I'm here. But you guys, man, you got each other, too. Yes, see, what you've done, you already done. But God forgave you for what you've done. Yes, he did. See, mm -hmm. see that's one thing. He, 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 he forgive you as far as the east is from the west. Yep. So you've been forgiven, man, and 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 not only that, now you out here and you're able to help others, and I really know that. I'm not just saying it. Well, That's gonna, the most important thing, man. I'll add this in, man, and that is, uh, real quick, I prayed for almost my whole time for a daughter. Wow. And I, I've got a, the beautifulest daughter. i seen a picture of Yeah. I How told old you is she? She's, she's fixed to be four, December 27th. Mm -hmm. Little beautiful Speaks girl. three languages. Can read and write. Well, I don't know about the write just completely yet, but uh, her math is good, and she At learns four. fast. Wow. But uh, now then, that being said, she's being taken care of by a friend because my ex is an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. uh, I pray that, you know, she's doing better now. Uh, but we've been separated almost a year, and you know, we went through some hell. We're living in all of our vehicles and, 
you know, and I kept trying. And you're but, not at a stage where you can get her and take care of her? No, and I, I'm not going to. My intentions is for the lady that has my daughter is to adopt her because she's been with her since she was just uh, one years old, right before she turned one. And she's doing an excellent job. There's no problem with me going and visiting my daughter or Michelle going and visiting my daughter. And I believe that that's where she belongs. Because, yeah. you know, when you bless a child and when you pray for something, it may not be exactly how you think you're putting it out there, but God's going to do the best. And he's able to handle everything. As long as so. you make sure you still try to be a part of her life. Most definitely. She knows who you are. And you, you know, lead her in a way which... That's what I try to do. I've got a goddaughter that is one of my friends, and she looks just like my daughter. Wow. Well, hey, man, I, I definitely, like I said, you guys are great, man. Um, guys, um, I'm going to keep you in my prayer. I appreciate it. Um, definitely, and I just want to make sure you guys know that, uh, like I said, nothing nothing happens by chance. That's right. Amen. That's right. Check it, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. And we out.